And so I think, yeah, be, be careful, but don't be too scared, I guess. No, no, don't be scared. Just do the research. Uh, don't write a Japanese-based story uh, after reading one Wikipedia article <laughs> and watching Akira. Yeah, you have to go further than that. Mm -hmm. uh, I won't write about a place unless I've been there. Uh, and one of my friends said, are oh, you going on a research trip? I said, yes, I'm going to Japan to research because I have to know what it likes, what it smells like. Yes. I can't write about a place unless I know what it smells like. <laughs> it's just the, the feeling, the different feelings you get from place. You, you, yeah, you have to be there. I did a lot of research on a place in Wales called Holly Island, uh, mm -hmm. and there's a village up there called Mountain. I'm like, wow, that's some, that's some serious coincidences there. And I did a Google Maps visit, but getting there and experiencing it because it was so cold and the wind just whistled across that mountain top. Yeah, it was very different. And then I met some locals i said i'm an author and i pulled the author card and i said i'm visiting can i come and talk to you because they had a website called hollyisland.com just basically sharing local gossip <laughs> and they took me to the tesco and we had tea and uh, scones and they told me the story about the village of mountain and how in welsh it was called red enclosure because that was where they rounded up the human sacrifices and they were quite open wow. about that background and that wasn't in the history books anywhere it was just local knowledge and the thing about moving rocks around on a local archaeological site uh yeah they, they i mentioned one of my characters says oh yeah we used to move the rocks around to annoy the archaeologists and this is what this person said when i went there he said when we were kids we used to smoke behind the the tomb and we used to move the rocks around to annoy the archaeologists. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you, you don't find this thing, these things out until you actually get there. Mm -hmm. yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So, travelling, good tip. <laughs> if if we oh, may ever do that again. Yeah, yeah. I'll, um, so, I can't, I can't write about India because I've never been there. I can't write about America much because I've never been there. Mm -hmm. Although America is on the media so much and and writing about heaven is easy because that's all in my in my imagination and yes that, that's also easy because uh chinese movies depict heaven and hell quite a lot and it's easy to use that as a reference and then mm -hmm. take it take it from there mm -hmm. yeah more fun yeah, than watching lord of the rings what <laughs> more fun than watching lord of the rings okay. <laughs> I mean, I love the Lord of the Rings, but I, I can totally see wanting something new as well. Well, I, I read The Hobbit when I was 12. Uh, <laughs> there's only so many times you can be presented with the same story without, without going, yeah, enough. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's already there. You can read that and then you can read something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can find it there. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... As I, as I wrote in the questions that I sent to you, there was yeah. some debate among students and also <laughs> lecturers whether there's a deliberate reference to Jane Eyre in White Tiger? Uh, yes. The whole nanny uh, employer. Yes. At the time I was writing it, I didn't want to go there. <laughs> I thought it was such a cliche having the nanny employer thing, throwing them in together. Uh, I wanted her in the house. It's, it's, you know, I want her in the house. I want them falling in love. I want them unable to touch. Then I want him in hospital and I want to have a hurt comfort uh, interaction there. Thoroughly fan fiction there. Uh, <laughs> so I was wandering around the house going, how am I going to get him into hospital? I need to get him into hospital. And I turned to my daughter who was like eight years old, how am I going to get him into hospital? Uh, and I didn't want her to be a nanny. I wanted her to have a little bit more of a high-powered career. But nanny was the only intelligent way I could get her to live in, to look after his, his daughter. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it does mimic Jane Eyre, but I couldn't at the time think of another way 
to throw them together. <laughs> you know, kissy stuff. Um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, not having her in the house would have made it too slow to have them falling in love. And I need them in mm. love, you know, now. It needs to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so I was well aware of the and it's not just it's not just Jane Eyre. This is a, a definite romance trope. Mm-hmm. Have you come in and you know falling in love with the employer because you've thrown them in together? Um, there there is a certain set of relationships that you can build a romance from. And as a novice writer, I was kind of angry that I had to choose this one. I didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the, the the I think it doesn't reference Jane Eyre. It's more like this is a situation where we can put our people. This is mm-hmm. a way we can set it up so our people get where we want them to go. I.e., kissing. <laughs> and uh, in Jane I, I was Eyre, well aware. Of, I was well aware of the Jane Eyre okay. thing. Though, yes, <laughs> yeah, and I didn't want to do it. Yep. <laughs> Well, if it's any consolation, as as I said, there was debate. There was there was me going, oh, there's there's Jane Eyre in there. You know, as a literary scholar, I got to see these intertextual references, yes. and I think they're great. I love them. And then I had some students go, yeah, yeah, I can see that. And other students, where are you pulling that from? That's way too. No, well, those students are wrong because it is definitely a Jane Eyre. It's not. Uh, built from Jane Eyre, but it and Jane Eyre are coming from the same place, mm. i.e., man, yes. woman, child, kissing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Big secret. Big uh, secret. I yeah, did, yeah, yeah, I didn't put a wife in the attic, but <laughs> <laughs> you do have a dead wife, though. <laughs> I do have. You, you have to have a dead wife if you're going to have a child. True, that's I mean, true. And you need a dead wife if you're going to, or a, or a wife in the attic. If you've got a needy child, you mm-hmm. need a full time governess. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so there's, it's just Lego being put in places and ending up with a similar thing to, oh my God, Jane Austen, how cool is that? Yay! Well, the next question we've already touched upon as well. Um, this is something that. Mm, a student assistant of ours uh, wondered yeah. and basically how do you balance a respectful and truthful representation of myths and legends and, and religion with artistic liberties and our student assistant thought you did very very well and thought uh, so she wanted just wanted to know how that figures into your writing process um uh. <laughs> I just think what would piss off the Chinese family, um, what would piss off my Chinese husband, what would, what would annoy them. And uh, I am very conscious of existing previous texts and mm-hmm. where they have gone and not going any further. I'm also trying to, what I'm trying to do is making the Chinese cultural experience the norm Mm -hmm. and the white cultural experience the exception. So very often I will have my Chinese characters totally astonished at something that my white character finds completely normal. She was bullied in school and didn't get great grades and the Chinese people are flabbergasted that someone would not have studied and tried to get as high grades Mm. as they could um come on man (laughs) so yeah i'm trying i'm actually putting myself into a chinese mindset which is not not too hard because when i was living in hong kong i was living in the chinese community full time i was the only white person i knew (laughs) (laughs) yeah i i had no white friends as such because the two communities didn't mix and I was a Chinese wife of a Chinese man with lots of Chinese men and uh, friends and Chinese family so my social situation was all Chinese so it was very easy to fall and grow into that mindset of of the Chinese culture and having that be the norm and having uh, the white there is a cultural cringe that anything white or European is better 
in Hong Kong. Uh, like there's a brand name called Giordano, which is 100% Chinese, but he named it Giordano so, so it would sound Italian. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a leather brand called Saatchi, same thing. Uh, and they actually had a bombardment of Italian advertising in Italian for Saatchi, which is 100% Chinese. <laughs> so being aware of the cultural nuances and coming down to, in the end, just being 100% respectful and not saying, I know all about this, mm -hmm. saying this is what it's like. Uh, I'm not there to show off my knowledge of Chinese culture. I'm there to share my experience, mm -hmm. which is a different thing. Uh, I don't want to show what it's, what this is what it is. I want to show this is how I saw it and this is how I experienced it. So, yeah, I think it comes a lot from attitude when going in to, to be respectful and to put yourself in the mindset and not look at it from the outside looking in, but to look at it from the inside mm -hmm. looking in. Yeah, I don't, I haven't clarified to myself what I've done right. <laughs> I know I've done it right. People come up to me and say I've done it right, but I don't know how I did it, really. <laughs> I suppose you, your background certainly helps. And probably Emma as a white protagonist also helps you get across that it's, it's her experience to some yeah. extent as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was very, very young when I married my husband and uh, willing to just uh, immerse myself and be extremely, ridiculously flexible and uh, accepting of every single weird stuff that he threw at me while I ate some weird things, we went and did weird stuff. Uh, even my Chinese standards, we, we did some pretty out there things. <laughs> on tours in China in the early 80s, just when it opened up. Mm -hmm. um, it was easy to travel into China and yeah, it, it, it was uh, very much an experience. So I've done things uh, and the, the dealt with an older generation that is no longer there. Uh, and visiting the, the family in China, none of that is there anymore. It's all high rises. They lived in a traditional village house next to another village house that was made out of buffalo dung and straw with a packed earth floor. There was no sewerage in the village when I visited there. There was no running water, no electricity uh, for most of the day. Um, and I, I was very, very accepting and just absorbed it all like a, a quiet little sponge. <laughs> and after 10 years, uh, I came back to Australia and disgraced all that again. <laughs> yeah. But it, it wasn't too, I don't think it was too hard for me to, to, my ex said that I was Chinese or Japanese in a previous life and this is why I adapted so well. I think it's just because I was really, really flexible and accepting and just mm -hmm. went along with everything because it was all so exciting and new. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But I yeah. have stories, I have stories about some of the stuff that happened in China but I won't bore you with them. <laughs> here's one, here's one. We went on a tour of Beijing and Guilin in 1984. China had just opened up. People would stop dead in the street and stare at me. Uh, we went to Beijing, we did the Forbidden City. It was falling down in the early 80s because the government had just opened up and China was still very, very poor. Uh, there was two currencies. One was for foreigners and one was for locals. I got the foreign currency and I could spend it in special stores. For foreigners, I could access to goods that weren't available to locals. So the family adored me and they could get, take me to the stores, gave me money to change, and then they bought so much stuff. So big TVs and laser disc players and a fridge that only worked like 12 hours a day because they had no electricity. Mm -hmm. um, but we went to Goilin and the, for some reason the hotel was full. This is uh, the place for the up and down mountains. And we went to a local Communist Party guest house and we were given this enormous room with this enormous bathroom. And it was so filthy because no one had been living in there forever. It had been built and then just left. And when we went into the bathroom and got it wet, we realized that the tiles weren't actually brown. They were white. 
and we were watching the dirt. It was just caked in dirt. Uh, the, the, underneath the beds was like this deep oh, in dust. It was filthy. Uh, I was so, so sick, uh, very, very ill. And we struggled through the tour and made it back to Hong Kong. And I was never so relieved <laughs> to see a place in my entire life. But yeah, 1984 in China was a definite experience. And mm. it, something I wouldn't share the world then we went and got married in we went back and got married in the village and had a traditional Chinese wedding in a village with no running water no electricity and no storage uh, the bathroom was a tiled area under the stairs with a bucket and a dipper uh, and they only bathed once a week because getting the water for the bucket was too much trouble mm. and they thought I, would, you know, this whole brushing your teeth and washing every day was just so decadent. They couldn't <laughs> believe. Mm. I learned that early, the, the, the real reason you have hairbrushes is to brush the dirt out of your hair after getting off the bus, off the dirt road. It was, yeah, a wild experience. And uh, I'm glad I got to live China mm. on the outside, yeah. It was great. The family thought I was hilarious and they took me everywhere. They thought I was a TV star because the only white people they saw were on the television. <laughs> <laughs> well, that must have been an interesting experience. It was. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm trying to share part of that with, mm. with my readers. But, yeah, I, I want it to be fun and not, not icky. So I mm. know some of that stuff out. Yeah. Right. Well, artistic liberties, I suppose. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> that's. I think that's one of the reasons Chinese people like it is because, as I said, I have whitewashed Hong Kong and made it more pretty than it actually is. And they're like, oh, she's made our city very flattering. We love it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good strategy then. Thank you. A little you. bit of flattery. <laughs> yes. So we've, we've just talked about your inspirations quite a lot, but uh, you're not the only Australian author who goes to East Asia for uh, inspiration for their fantasies. You mentioned Lean Han at the beginning, yes. and there are a couple of others, I think. So why, why do you think that is? What's, what's this interest by Australian writers into uh, East Asian culture, mythology? <laughs> the real reason is it's close. Uh-huh. It's not too far to travel. <laughs> I mean, that's fair enough. Um, uh, you know, I went to Wales to do research. Uh, I have low blood pressure. I had to stop over halfway mm -hmm. and spend the night in Singapore because if I did it all in one go, uh, I've tried doing it all in one go and I'm absolutely crippled with jet lag to the degree that I uh, I get vertigo. I can't stand up. The, the walls move around me for at least mm. 24 hours. Up. Oh, God, I thought I needed to go to the hospital the first time it happened. Mm -hmm. I need to take a break. It's a long way. It's very <laughs> expensive to go to Europe from Australia. <laughs> Asia, on the other hand, like uh, Hong Kong, Japan is eight hours. Mm -hmm. Singapore, seven hours. Bali is a couple of hours. So we go to Asia a lot because it's close and cheap. Mm -hmm. and so this is, this is where we are. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Asia has come to us a lot. So we have a lot of Asian influ influence within the community. Uh, so we, yeah, we are part of the Asian community. We're really part of Asia. We're not part of Europe at all. Although we like to pretend <laughs> that we're just off the coast of the UK. <laughs> Australia has always tried to pretend that we're just off the coast of the UK. That would be very cold. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that makes perfect sense to me. Uh, and geographically, certainly, Australia is, is part of, of Asia, not, not Europe in any way. Yes. So, yes. Uh, certainly my my ex-husband came to Australia because that's the first place Hong Kong people come. Mm -hmm. When they want to leave Hong Kong, go to the West, mm -hmm. we're the closest place. So... Australia's full of Hong Kong people and mm. everyone I met in Hong Kong, everyone I met in Hong Kong, Hong Kong Chinese all knew someone or had someone in their family who had gone to Australia. Everyone's been to Australia. Yeah. Mm. Like yeah. It's, it's like an extended suburb of Hong Kong, really. <laughs> that in Canada. Yeah. 
<laughs> that, those are some very different places. Canada's different because in 1988, after Tiananmen, Canada opened its borders and accepted anybody from Hong Kong could get a Hong, uh, could get a Canadian passport, and everyone just rushed over there, got their mm -hmm. Canadian passport as a backdoor to escape, just in case. What happened in Hong Kong right now? With everyone knew it was inevitable that there would be a crackdown on the dem democratic process in in Hong Kong. We always we discussed it we always believed that china would not be stupid enough to kill the golden goose mm -hmm. because hong kong's rule of law brought a lot of money into china but the current chinese administration is is really paranoid about any form of protest so yeah um, i won't go into that but i can't right. i don't i can go safely back to hong kong as it is right now after mm -hmm. some of the like, things i've said online which is heartbreaking mm. but i would not take back saying any of the things right. i said follow me on twitter to see all my political denouncements <laughs> <laughs> do you think that yeah, so that's why that's why a lot of canada as well is because yes. everyone in hong kong also has a canada passport uh they also right. have british national overseas bno passports but they don't give you the right to live in the uk you're a British citizen who can't actually go and live there. Although the UK's in the current situation, they're talking about changing that so that you can actually go and live in the UK. But if you have a, a, a wanted career, a skill set that is wanted in Australia, mm -hmm. and you have good English skills, mm -hmm. and because they have Australia and Hong Kong have the, the British background, so people from the hospital system, like my ex-husband and the legal system uh, and the administration system, uh, particularly the medical system, can come here and do the examinations and just walk straight into a job as a doctor or a nurse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also legal. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's why we have this big Hong Kong, Australia and also Hong Kong, Canada. Yes, yeah. sounds very much like a mutual relationship that, that has yes. people going to one place and others <laughs> taking their place coming there they, they tend to come here mm. realize they're not going to make as much money as they would back in hong kong mm. stay here just long enough to get the passport and then <laughs> head back to hong kong to make more money and very often the family will stay here in australia and the husband will go backwards and forth and to be honest that's what i did i came back here with the kids mm -hmm. in 2002 and my ex would go backwards and forwards and they actually had a term for them they call them astronauts um, <laughs> australia new zealand canada the the breadwinner would go backwards and forwards and mm -hmm. it was easy for him to provide for the family in australia because it was so much cheaper here than the rent in hong kong or property prices in hong kong ridiculous property prices in hong kong <laughs> I, I can only imagine so did 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 well, in your Q and A, you talk about the the estrangement from Western fantasy on the parts of your family, your your ex husband, your children. Did that yeah. come into your decision to write, uh, well, the Dark Heavens trilogy? Very actually, much. Or series? Very much. Mm. I wanted to share the culture with my kids. Mm -hmm. It didn't work. Both of them grew up, and one of them is one hundred percent Aussie bloke. And the other one speaks fluent Japanese and wants to go and live in Japan again. Uh, she's lived in Japan before. And so, yeah, my efforts. The first book was very much, this is your mythology, this is your culture. Mm -hmm. But they don't want to read it because it's, a, it's too much of an intimate look at mum's head. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which is valid. I think so. so. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I wrote it for them. I, I wrote it for my sister. I did write it for my sister because she was stuck in a cubicle in government in Canberra and mm. I wanted her to slip into the skin of a kick-ass Hong Kong heroine. She came and visited me in Hong Kong and loved the culture and mythology. So I thought I'll, I'll give more to her. And actually the, the, the character is, is quite a lot her because I wrote it for her. I'm like, this is you being awesome. Look where you went, look what you did. Yeah. Um, so it is, it is for family, but I failed 
at <laughs> giving my kids their culture, you're yeah, not interested. Although my I son mean, is very much into food, which is a Hong Kong aspect. I think. <laughs> well, I suppose that's, that's something you can't control. <laughs> no, I can't. No, <laughs> absolutely not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, I think you, you certainly gave your sister a, a very cool character to, to identify with. I really like the yeah. part where um, I think it's both Leo and John tell her, oh, you're not like other women. And she goes, no, you're just sexist pigs. Yeah, exactly. I love that. <laughs> yeah, they, they're like, oh, you're supposed to collapse in the crying heat right now. And she's like, go to hell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't care. Australian. We we wrestle crocodiles for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming that you did that this morning, right? Oh, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Half a dozen spiders in my boots this morning. Yeah. Quite often we talk about uh, strong female characters, about yeah. femininity, but I think yeah. that masculinity is just as important when it comes to gender equality, gender diversity, and feminism. Yeah. So I. I wanted to talk about John Chen and different depictions of masculinity in, in White Tiger, because I think yeah. that was so interesting. You've got so many different characters. Uh, I watch the television and your action hero is solving things with violence always. Mm -hmm. And there's the, I'm uh, being pulled up for this, the toxic masculine you must be cool and emotionless yes. at all times thing and i'm having the opportunity to present a masculinity that is not it is still strong but it's, well uh, and also this guy is the embodiment of the the thing of yin which is soft and feminine mm -hmm. and let's face it very feminine guys can be extremely hot just look at k-pop bands oh yes and they're female <laughs> drooling fans they these guys are just they're not handsome they are beautiful mm -hmm. in a very feminine beautiful way but at the same time they, they're, they're men and girls love that so why not throw in a hero who's got some softer aspects because girls love that once again i'm producing a product <laughs> with your, your female audience and i wanted to counter point him against the element of yang which is the white tiger so i made him a sexist asshole and women love him too he's a very sort of brusque emotionless uh man box masculine yes. and he's counterpointed against john who's who's quite soft i even call him marshmallow feminine and, uh, i turned him into a woman in book seven <laughs> for a while just for the yeah um i told i told stephanie uh in book seven he's going to be a woman and we're going to have a lesbian love scene and she said good um, <laughs> she sounds great i like her <laughs> she's great um i just just wanted a a man who isn't you know the 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 male mm. wanted it, there's two types of, of hero there's the type that you want to be and there's the type you want to love mm -hmm. it's not actually the word love but okay um and the, for the females the one you want to be is the kick-ass heroine and the one you want to love is the the feminine love interest who, the, the manic pixie girl is an archetype of that she's the sort of girl that men want to love Mm -hmm. And the male archetype, the tough space marine, is what the men want to be. But the softer, the, huge, the two aspects of Hugh Jackman are very much this. The yes. musical theatre star wearing cashmere sweaters is what women want to love. And Wolverine is what men want to be. Mm -hmm. So we've got this dichotomy. So I've done that as well. I've got a hero that women adore because he's a bit softer and he's not scary. Uh, he's not cold and emotionless. He's in touch with his feelings and he's just a sensitive guy. Uh, yeah. Whereas the white tiger is, is, and he's not forcing it either. And then you've got the blue dragon who's one pretending to be the other. 
which was one of my big character reveals where he's actually mm. this extremely effeminate, effeminate dude, although he is straight, mm. pretending to be the cold, masculine yes. asshole. So, yeah, I've got, I've got that dichotomy. He goes deliberate. I just want, yeah, someone for women to mm. love rather than someone for men to be. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've, I've gone even further in the Dragon Empire. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's that's like catering to the female gaze rather than the male gaze. I think oh, that's very much so. Really, yeah, he's, he's for mm. the female gaze. Uh, there's a lot of fan fiction research went into that as well. <laughs> what what women want from their hero? Generally, mm. they want squishy, pretty and squishy. Lots mm -hmm. of long hair, squishy, pretty, yes. yeah, kind, kindy, kind guys. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we got all that. Put it all together. I didn't want to give him long hair, but it's the canon that he must have long hair. The mm. Dark Lord of my canon has long hair, and I was disappointed that um, because I didn't want him to be too much like uh, Oren from Final Fantasy XI, who is that wounded warrior archetype. Yeah. Right. That, that, that female, mm. female gamers adore Oren because he's that wounded warrior kind of squishy archetype so yeah. of course <laughs> <laughs> i think it's, it's also very important that john chen even though he's he's a feminine character he's not uh he's not effeminate in a way uh, that you often see uh when chinese men are being orientalized yes. and weak uh weak effeminate yes. <laughs> things so. they're, they're trying to make men into what they think women are Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. rather than what women really are yes so, yeah yes so you're seeing men being this kind of stereotypical feminine weak mm -hmm. silly, screaming character when no that's why leo is so very masculine yes um and yeah a lot of straight men were uh idolize leo because he is just so damn awesome um and <laughs> yes. have complained to me why did you give him aids and i'm like well why not because aids mm. is something that only gay men get that's right yes but he's um, gay. yeah he is i mean they, not... they, they 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 have trouble connecting leo with the gay stigma that they have yeah already yeah, it's been asked a couple of times by straight men why I had to give Leo this this disease. It's only for bad gays. He's a good gay. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think I I regret. Well, I wanted to counterpoint the fashion thing with Leo is smartly dressed, whereas everyone else is is rubbish. Um, I love his frustration with John and Emma. It's it's endearing. It's like. What am I going to do with those two? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, and uh, gay people have said, yeah, well, that's a little bit stereotypical. Mm. And I say, look at your outfit. And they say, okay, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sometimes I have to think about what um, Chimamanda and Gozi Adichie says about this, the danger of a single story. That Yes these stereotypes they can exist the problem comes up and they're they the only exist. story yes <laughs> yes it's the worst thing in the world when you're having a life experience and you're meeting people and they just slot so hard into the stereotype and you go if i wrote you no one would believe me yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's the worst experience in the world yeah <laughs> <laughs> I want something interesting. I don't want a walking cliche like you are. Yeah. <laughs> that poor person, though. <laughs> very little they uh, representation. They're very comfortable in their identity. They just don't mm. know that I'm sitting there quietly judging. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was I going to say? Uh, uh, oh yeah, I, I think your your straight male fans. Um, will be in for shock when they learn that AIDS can actually be contracted by everybody. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, mm. there's this, this 
it's a very hind brain mm. basic basic stigma but mm -hmm. this is australian men so you have to cut them a bit of slack as well right. australian men are special yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> you know i read a review on white tiger on goodreads that that was very it was very positive but then it said oh but but this john chen he's He's so feminine. How awful. He's so weak because he uh, takes care of his daughter and uh, yeah. loves his, his wife and loves Emma. It's like, yeah, that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah. yeah, someone walked in expecting the male action hero. Mm -hmm. You can see the, them mm -hmm. walking in expecting the hero that they want to yeah. be. And this is not the hero they want to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they, they walk right up straight into their own prejudice yes yep, and hit it hard sorry sorry dude i don't read the reviews because if i do the read the reviews i go and sit in the corner and cry for a long time oh there's no I need to everything personally <laughs> <laughs> i think the first review on your goodreads page is uh like i think it's, it's by uh, rebecca lim you might know her um yes like chinese jane eyre or Jane Eyre mixed with, with Vusha films. So I think you'd be pleased yes. with that. <laughs> oh, well, that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> you said that, I'm like, oh no, she's being, she's telling me that it's awful and derivative. No, 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 no. It was, it was definitely a positive review. <laughs> there, there, is one, there is one review on Amazon that starts with worst, worst book ever, which I'm rather proud of. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, if if everybody likes what you write, then you've done something wrong, probably. Yes. 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 <laughs> um, the next question is both about what you're working on currently, and you've already oh. hinted at that a little bit. Yeah. And whether you think that the current situation, quarantine, lockdown, will impact mm -hmm. your writing or speculative fiction writing in general. I hate people in general, so being able to avoid everybody has just been the best mm -hmm. and not having to go outside and being able to sit inside all day is a dream come true. Uh, so, and also because I'm a writer and I live with two cats by myself, the difference has been non-existent except mm -hmm. that I have gone out less and um, we haven't had a community transmitted case of COVID in my state since July. Oh, that's, that's good. Things, things are back to normal here. Mm. Queensland has pretty much reopened and since we don't have any community cases, <laughs> back to normal. Mm -hmm. uh, my daughter is going to come up from Sydney uh, in December for Christmas. So Australia as a whole, uh, Victoria locked down, we've got a few cases in South Australia, but generally we closed our borders and we locked down and COVID is not a thing here anymore. Mm -hmm. But while we were locked down, for me, it wasn't much different. Also, I was producing that uh, uh, pitch deck for the TV people, mm -hmm. which was a massive amount of work and I just buried myself in that. But for me, living the life of a people hating hermit, <laughs> pretty much position normal for me so it didn't make much difference it did mean that all of the pop culture conventions stopped and my income from workshops and conventions uh, just really bottomed out mm -hmm. but i was el eligible for some government assistance back back then but that has also stopped um so hopefully yeah things will pick up again next year mm -hmm. but it has hit my income hard for the writing no i've, I've been i've been writing words um harper collins australia offered me a new contract now that dragon empire is finished but uh i won't accept a contract for a new work until i'm sure that it's got legs uh mm -hmm. and that it will go beyond the first three chapters because i have so many first three chapters sitting on my hard disk yeah, yeah. um thank you <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i was working with a visual artist oh queenie was brilliant um we i gave her small shen which was half past half present 
and she only illustrated the interesting bits, which was medieval China, but she was so good at it. And then she interlaced the two stories, past and present. So we had prose and then images. And she did that. And when she created the manga of the past history, she translated my text into images. And it was just, she, she took my work and made it exponentially better. <laughs> um, and then we uh, talked together about what we're doing. She's like, oh, those speech bubbles that I put in the manga, they were only placeholders. And you didn't change any of them. I'm like, yeah, they were so good already. <laughs> yeah. The only thing I changed of her art was I removed electrical cords from the late 1800s. That she, she without even thinking, put, oh, and she used the uh, expression, she had one of the characters in the 1800s saying, okay. And we had a little discussion about the fact that okay didn't exist until the early 1900s. But yeah, <laughs> oh my God, she took, she took what I had written and then just lifted it up to a level that I cannot achieve. So thank you, Queenie. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that was, and we are like, oh yeah, we should really write, she's like, oh, yeah, I really want you to write something medieval Chinese. And I'm like, yeah, we should really should write something medieval Chinese. <laughs> and yeah, we, she hasn't had a chance to berate me about that recently because all the conventions in Australia has stopped. So we yeah. meet up at a convention, get drunk with all the comic book artists, she go, oh, you really need to write another medieval story for me to illustrate. And I'm like, yeah, I know, I really need to do it. And then we part ways until the next <laughs> convention. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, I, I love Small Shen and I open it to a particular double page spread that's so beautiful. I go, this is so beautiful. Yeah, her mm -hmm. characters. Her character design for the blue dragon was an old, thin faced, ugly dude. And I said, no, the blue dragon is the guy in the martial arts drama who's the son of the local warlord. And he goes through the market with his two henchmen knocking everything over. And he's really good looking and a horrible creep. And she went, oh, I know. And then drew him exactly the way I envisaged him as the creep who goes through the market knocking over all the stalls. She knew. So we said <laughs> that's kind of wuxia experience uh -huh. we knew we're both coming from the same place here and sharing with our experience because there, there are tropes in wuxia and one of them is the son of the local warlord who's mm -hmm. an asshole and then the good he kidnaps the the hero's girlfriend and takes her up to the house and the hero has to go and fight all the guards to release the girlfriend who then yells at him and is a bit petulant and then they run down and they have to run away and that's episode one of every wish I ever yeah <laughs> <laughs> I just so love we, visual storytelling so I was really excited to see that you had oh, this mixture yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. Harper Collins uh, that's the only visual novel Harper Collins have ever done and I think they've vowed never to do it again because it was a completely different paradigm, publishing paradigm for what they were used to. Mm -hmm. to as well. <laughs> yeah. uh, such a brilliant experience. Thank you, Queenie. <laughs> um, I was wondering, do you know in how many languages White Tiger has been translated? Has it been translated? Yeah, one. Um, I have a diehard fan in Japan. Who's translated the books into Japanese? Um, what happens is that people contact because I don't own the one. I don't own the world rights, the translation rights. Mm -hmm. You have to contact Harper Collins, mm -hmm. and they are ferociously busy. So you have to actually be an existing publishing house. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is what my Japanese super fan did. She has a publishing house and she contacted HarperCollins and said, I would like to buy Japanese language rights. And HarperCollins are like, yes. But what happens is a lot of people contact HarperCollins and say, we would like to translate this book into German. And that's not how you go about it because you have to buy the rights and say that you want to put money up front. Mm. Otherwise, they will ignore you. Because it happens so often that people go, I want to translate the book. How do we do this? 
Whereas the correct way to approach it is to say, I want to buy the language rights. Um, also, they're, they're ferociously busy and they don't often have time to answer the emails. So sometimes those emails go ignored. I have one email like that right in front of me right now for French language. <laughs> Where is it? I'm a French writer and translator. Your books sound very interesting. Have you considered having them translated into French? Uh, and this person is a freelancer and wants me to pay them money to translate the books into French, right? Mm -hmm. And we get emails like this all the time. And the correct way for a publisher to do it is to approach and say, I'm the Polish publisher of sci-fi. Mm -hmm. I want to buy the foreign language rights. So obviously no one's done that. No one, no German publisher has contacted HarperCollins and said, I want to buy the German language rights. Mm -hmm. And my books have been in Frankfurt Book Fair and things like that. And I think overseas, they are still a kind of niche story that not many people really have heard of. And I've been described as having a cult following, which is just weird and gratifying. Thank you, everybody. Uh, but yeah, the, the, it's not been the big success overseas that it has been in Australia. And it's just so wonderful to be contacted by you. Thank you so much. You make me very happy. Yes. Oh, well, you make me but very yeah, that's, happy. That's, <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's the situation as we constantly get people asking us, pay me money and I will translate it. And it doesn't work like that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So if your students set up a publishing house, absolutely contact HarperCollins and offer to buy the, it only costs a thousand dollars to buy, it only costs a thousand dollars to buy the language rights. That's not too bad actually. <laughs> it's not too bad. Okay. Okay. So um, I think we've, already reached well already we've been talking for quite a bit <laughs> the last fun question um, oh yeah yes gaming. you say on your website you're a gamer and so yes. what kind of fun games have you been playing lately i can't play first person shooters they make me nauseous mm -hmm. um so i play third person action games and i first game i ever completed was tomb raider one on the playstation one so i'm old uh, Final Fantasy 7 when it first came out for PC and then on PlayStation 1. I no longer have a PS1 but I still have a PS2, PS3, PS4 and PS5. In wow. fact I have two, two PlayStation 3s. Um, I'm trying to give one away to my kids and neither of them want it. Um, now that I've got PlayStation 5 I don't need the PS4. I bought, I pre-ordered the PlayStation 5 Mm -hmm. Right now, oh yeah, games. Right now, I'm playing Ghost of Tsushima, ah. which is Assassin's Creed Japan. I've played all the Assassin's Creed. I didn't finish Assassin's Creed Three because there weren't enough rooftops. And uh, <laughs> yeah, um, I've loved Assassin's Creed right from the word go. I'm I love sneaking around and stabbing people in the back. I have creatively created piles of bodies for my friends to screenshot and send to them i'm like i'm going i'm getting off this call now i'm going to create an artistically piled bodies and yeah um <laughs> just i'm very stabby um ghost of tsushima is very engrossing this that i wrote i play for the stories so we've got interactive stories where you can talk to people and make choices. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so my favorite games are the games with stories like Detroit Become Human, which is so problematic. <laughs> wow, you could write essays on that one. Um, Horizon Zero Dawn for me is the best sci-fi movie to come out in recent years. The story on that uh and the big twists uh just absolutely brilliant horizon zero dawn um and the landscape yeah um watchdogs one is set in in um um chicago and golly that's an ugly city very boring 
so I'm, I'm there for the location and the story. So I'm moving through a film and experiencing a film. Uh, so if there's mountaintops where I can stand and take screenshots of beautiful sunsets, I'm really there. Um, and if there's great interactions and just big story twists like there is in Horizon Zero Dawn where you finally reveal the truth of what happened is kind of mind boggling. And I'm sitting back going, wow, this story is amazing. I love this. I love these twists. I love the fact that some people are really, uh, really evil at doing stuff for the common good. Um, yeah, uh, Fallout 4, um, that's mostly the exploration and story part of it as well as some people that are really really fun to hate mm -hmm. i love that there's no uh the good guys are really weak and worthless and you've got a choice between mad robots mad zombies and mad nazis in fallout 4 and you have to choose which group of mad bad guys you're nodding along like you know all of this um yeah <laughs> well i know i haven't actually got a playstation i know about games a bit um my best friend has a playstation i've got a nintendo switch so i definitely uh understand this this exploration uh <laughs> appeal because yeah. i've got breath of the wild <laughs> my daughter i was playing fallout 4 and i was playing an expansion where they make you robots with people's brains in them and you're going through the lab where the condemned prisoners and this all happened 100 years ago but it's all still there mm -hmm. all the equipment to rip people's brains out and put them and there's there's banks of jars bubbling with brains in them and their personalities are erased and they're made into murder bots right it's so i play this on my playstation it's straight up it's straight up body horror mm -hmm. straight up horror really creepy Lots of damp, atmospheric uh, jail, corpses, yeah. Occasional zombies coming out, yeah. And my daughter's playing on her Switch and she's playing um, Breath of the Wild, where the gentle forest <laughs> creatures are helping you to achieve your goal of saving the kingdom. And I'm playing, this is where we rip the brains out to make the murder bots. And... <laughs> I can understand why she wants to play the Switch because she's not into that sort of horror, but I'm just having a blast going through the creepy zone. Yeah, and that, that little story, that was a, a little expansion, and the storyline, it also had a big twist at the end. Um, so it was, yeah, the, the places that the games position themselves. Yeah, there's, there's the mm. I want to be the big action hero type games, the very masculine, stomp on everything, shoot everything, solve it all with a gun. Um, and then the negotiation story type things where not everyone is the bad guy. Assassin's Creed mm. tends to do that as well, where not everyone's, the, not everyone's as bad. Yeah, no, one, no one's that good either. <laughs> yeah, so you, 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 can, you can break the tropes that um, the traditional houses in TV and publishing to a degree expect you to fill these requirements for your story, whereas games are just like totally out there. Mm -hmm. And there was a big furor. I remember when Mass Effect 1 came out and it had an alien sex scene in it. And I remember in Hong Kong people going absolutely berserk about that. Um, <laughs> And since then, games have just escalated into uncharted, wonderful territory, and mm -hmm. TV's kind of lag behind. Yeah. yeah. So that's where yeah. the real good stories are coming out, I think. That's true. Uh, I, I agree. There's so much different kinds of storytelling that you could put into a video game. I yeah. mean, you, you just mentioned these the interactive games where your choices influence what happens, but also these action-packed yeah. games. And then you've got something like Breath of the Wild, where you very much write the story yourself while playing. Yes, yes. Uh, my, my personal link has an attention problem <laughs> because I'll be <laughs> going to a quest and it's like, oh, there's a butterfly. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mm. So it's, it's very I keep doing that in Ghost of Tsushima. It keeps telling me to go back, go back <laughs> to, <laughs> to the person you're following. Yeah, stop following <laughs> the, the, the bird. Yeah. But no, it's so I'm, much I'm more really... fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a thing out there. 
there. Yes. <laughs> yeah, um, I really so enjoy I, open I, world. <laughs> I am, yeah, I'm enjoying the storytelling in games more than I'm enjoying the storytelling on standard television. Mm. Like everyone's raving about a show called Shit's Creek because it's funny, but I get on it and I cannot relate to the main characters. I just find them mm -hmm. selfish and intolerable. And everyone's going, oh, they're so cute and funny. And I'm like, no, they aren't. They're awful. These are awful <laughs> people. And I can understand why this comedy is about awful people after dealing with some of the people at high levels in production in America and seeing the sort of people at, yeah, producers in America, you can understand how, yeah, they find this sort of thing relatable. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas, yeah, this is, gamers are aware, game designers are aware of their gender issues and are trying to address it, but occasionally they trip over. Yes. Um, uh, Watch Dogs 2, I really enjoyed that, uh, but... Uh, their main character is a person of colour, a man of colour, and they actually uh, discuss that the black guy is always the first guy to die. Now, you young gamers, they know this trope, that mm -hmm. whenever there's a black guy in the story, he's the first one to die. Um, and the main character is a black dark guy, and there's another main character who's also black, and obviously you can't have two of them. Because, yeah. It happens, and it happened, and I'm like, no, you, you just did not mm -hmm. pull that trope out, wave it in my face, say you weren't going to do it, and then did it anyway. I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, this is where it becomes uh, an experienced storyteller looks at that and goes, yeah, that's executive meddling from some editor somewhere going saying, yeah, we've got too many black people. Oh Jesus, <laughs> we oh. need we need a white lens to tell this story through. <laughs> You, yeah, um, your, your protagonist is, um, I, I've been rejected by American um, Asians because my stuff is too easy to read uh, and it comes off as YA, but the story content isn't YA, so they don't know where to put mm -hmm. me. Whereas I know exactly where I am. I'm for everybody and I'm an easy, fun read for everybody, even people who aren't strong readers. Yeah. And you love so me then, old boys. <laughs> <laughs> I do read beautiful lyrical literature and think I would like to write. I don't think I can. Mm -hmm. I just want to get the story out and get it done and get it vivid and bright and share it with people. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a bad person for, yeah, just <laughs> wanting to share my stories and tell everybody. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Thank you so much. Um, oh, thank that... you, Bettina. <laughs> wow, that was fun. That, that was, was so much fun. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk more. I do need to go and eat. <laughs> it's not possible to eat at night. complaining. I need to feed them. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad you took so much time to answer all our questions. It was it was a great conversation. I hope I didn't talk too much. I think I did. Absolutely not. I, I loved hearing all of this. Do you have any My final words? My anxiety kicked in afterwards and go, oh no, I said awful things. <laughs> <laughs>